but it should be a radical departure from what is uh, conventional enterprise uh, architecture. I'm calling it architecture engineering to signal the fact that it's more like an, uh, an engineering discipline in the sense it's very quantitative, okay? So that's the, if you like, paradigm uh, shift. Well, what is architecture? I'll bet everybody here has a different definition from everybody else, but at least I have my own personal definitions and personal ideas, so let me uh, offer them to you for consideration. Uh, I, I believe, number one, that architecture is a discipline and a process that is there to satisfy requirements, okay? And that's the primary idea, okay? Uh, I have a, a paper which you can access later through the link there called Basic Design, uh, Design Logic, and it starts with stakeholders and requirements and moves into design and finally moves into the delivery of the designs. It's, uh, it's, uh, I believe there's a logic to it, and the logic starts with requirements, and really good requirements, not use cases, user stories, and flimsy things like that, okay? Uh, here's another uh, picture of the idea. Uh, uh, the requirements I'm interested in are value requirements and quality requirements. I think they are the primary reasons for most projects. I also believe that they are all uh, variable, uh, and, and therefore can be numeric. But there are things like security, maintainability, usability, and uh, those are technical values and other values that your domain might have. We also uh, are ruled by some uh, resource requirements like people, time, money, short-term, long-term, and recurrent. And when I say requirements, I'm primarily ref uh, referring to these and not so much to function uh, requirements. They drive the architecture process and produce an architecture, and I believe uh, we need to look at the relationship between the architectural ideas we're spawning and how they impact our values, in other words, how well they deliver quality and how much they consume of resource. And I believe we can do that on a table, which I'll show you more detailed and more readable versions of in a moment, okay? so. Uh, I, I've, I've looked at almost all the architectural methods I can find at various conferences like this and uh, lectures and on the internet, and I find there's an absence of this idea that the requirements are quantified primarily, okay? And there's even an absence of addressing those requirements. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, how many people here say, would say, I always uh, deal with and only deal with quantified requirements for essential things like security and user friendliness assistance. We say that part of my discipline. Not a lot of hands. One, okay, hi. We should meet later. <laughs> okay, so that's not part of our custom. Uh, and I, I believe it is uh, impossible to do a good job of our, uh, any kind of IT or enterprise architecture without that quantified platform, that, that really clear idea of well, exactly how much security do we need, exactly how much user friendliness do we need or whatever we're doing. Um, so here's architecture engineering. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's, it really is systems engineering, number one, or systems architecture. It's, uh, um, and there are lots of sub-disciplines. We'll look at some of them during the talk. Okay, here's another picture, the larger picture of engineering, systems engineering, and finding what we're doing. And some of the, uh, let me think, well, that's just the nine minute after the keynote start snooze button, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, including requirements, disciplines, and design disciplines, and implementation disciplines. When I say requirement, here's my map from the competitive engineering book of which I will be offering you a free digital copy. So I'm not advertising the book, I'm giving it away, right? Uh, the, uh, my ideas of requirements, uh, many people have a very uh, simplified idea of requirement like a user story or a functional requirement. I have a much more complex idea which even includes things like designs which are requirements called design constraints and performance targets which are these variables such as all the quality requirements. And uh, I think we need a richer picture of what requirements are and how they differ and what we're gonna do with them in architecture to do good architecture. But this is thoroughly laid out in the book. 
finally, there are lots of different specification types here, if you like, under design specification, synonym for any kind of architectural specification. Uh, here are requirement specifications. And here's something we're going to look at in, in slightly more depth here, an impact estimation table, which relates the incoming requirements to the architecture we have proposed. Finally, EVO plans and steps are uh, agile delivery of the architecture so as to attain the properties such as uh, uh, security and usability that we're looking for. Now, I asked myself a question in preparing the talk. Does uh, IT architecture, enterprise architecture, just for fun, I sometimes call it soft texture, have any professional and ethical obligations to their employers and to society? And I found a list of professional obligations that I'm going to go through in, in uh, some detail, the main body of the talk, if you like. Uh, just to, that I would call, you know, we, we should be doing these things. We should consider that part of our work. Uh, I'll, uh, I also found some ethical obligations and even a very interesting link to, uh, you know, architecture ethics, which you might like to look at. Here's a first cut of it. And uh, I wonder if uh, enterprise architecture has any ethics of a similar nature, but that will be for another talk, another time, or some of you might like to develop that talk. Uh, just for fun, I, I drafted what I called a, a code of things I think we ought to feel responsible for. Again, for example, we have to feel responsible for the long-term uh, aspects of the system, things like that. But again, I'm not going to pursue that further. I'm going to dive in and do the professional obligations uh, in a little bit more uh, detail. So the first professional uh, obligation is that when people, uh, your client comes to you with really atrociously bad requirements, isn't that the norm? I mean, how many people say, no, my client always has perfectly clear, uh, stable requirements, no question, no problem, that's the norm. Uh, no, no, so nobody's volunteering that one either. Right, so the only problem, the question is, are you just going to say, well, the reason I did bad architecture is because they gave me bad requirements. Garbage in, garbage out. Or you say, no, part of my professional obligation is to sort out those requirements, even though it's not, strictly speaking, my job. Because otherwise, I'm forced to do a bad job. Okay? So I think we have to just get involved because the people doing requirements, they're called business analysts sometimes, are not very good at their trade, to put it mildly. Here's some evidence of that. The, the, example, 100 unclear words per page is the norm of what they put in. I've been measuring this for quite a while, so I, I, I'm not exaggerating at all. Here's the first step. Now, uh, uh, this list, um, it doesn't really matter what it says, but it's, it's got a lot of what I call values. Uh, here's a simple value. We're going to look at it in more depth in a moment, security. Uh, but uh, 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 there's a real set of values for uh, a, a project we had. And uh, values are just anything that the stakeholders consider critical or important and want to improve. Okay? Values. Some of these values are qualities like security and user friendliness, but they're not all uh, qualities. And the point is, uh, we need to make sure that all the values of the clients are listed systematically. Let this be symbolic for a, a list. But then, uh, one of them is security, and this is a simple example of what I mean by clarifying and quantifying security. It starts off maybe with the management uh, bullshit that we're going to have very high security. I call that the ambition level. But we quickly dive down into a scale of measure. Uh, I'll take the trouble to read that. Percentage of attack types per year from attack sources using attack methods under environmental, environmental conditions towards a certain organization. That's my scale of measure with several um, parameters so that I can talk about the really complex combinations of all of these things. And then uh, a status is a current level, the one we're dissatisfied with and want to improve, but it's numeric and it's very clear. And finally, wish level is what the stakeholder would value and like to have if they could afford it and if the technology were there. Okay, so we've now set the stage for architecture with maybe 20 such declarations. And the job of the architect is to ideally find a set of architecture that leads us to the wish levels uh, within the uh, resource constraints and within any other constraints such as legal constraints. European law, if that be valid, probably will be even after Brexit anyway. Okay, but uh, so that, take that as a simple example of what I mean by quantifying a requirement, declaring a scale of measure and declaring points on that scale, 
in this case, status, how bad we are, and wish what, what would be valued by our clients. And then the job of the architect having this really clear input is find architecture that will give us this wish level and maybe simultaneously give us 20 such wish levels within four or five resource constraints such as time, money, uh, people in the short and long term. Point number two help the client to understand the consequences of the requirements. Uh, so the consequences, now this is a simple impact estimation table, and I just put the security um, requirement up there, but there will be finally uh, maybe 10 or 20 other ones. I put in a couple uh, ideas of, of uh, resources such as this budget and time, and I plug in two architectural ideas we're just using our needs. One is called the needs and means tool, and you're actually looking at an example of the needs and means tool right here. And this is language by planning language. So they're just two design ideas. And what we're doing is we're scoring them. 51% here means that this architectural idea will get me halfway towards my goal, I think. And I could be wrong. It will consume 2% of my capital budget and 3% of my development time. So that's pretty good. This uh, other thing, which may be an option or complementary design, uh, gets me to about 100% of my goal, all the way to the goal, but it does consume 30% of my capital budget and of uh, my time. So it's, not, uh, it's powerful, but it's costly. So these are uh, some of the uh, consequences of what they asked for. One consequence was we needed certain technologies to be brought in the best we can find that they are maybe not uh, fulfilling the uh, objective fully, maybe only halfway, so that's not enough alone. And even though this is estimated to be at 100%, maybe it won't really get there, and we wouldn't mind having a little backup idea that'll get us the rest of the way. We can also compute value for money, and we get a value to cost idea, where this idea turns out to be uh, about uh, five times more powerful value for money than this. It's another thing that the architects need to do is be very conscious of values for resource sets. And the only way to do that is going to be numeric. You can't just say encryption is great for security. I've done my job and on we go. Okay? So uh, the, uh, all kinds of, you know, these are the consequences. The impact on our values, the impact on our costs, the, uh, re re the uh, value for money impact. And here is actually the impact of maybe doing a series of these and you know, the, the total impact uh, uh, over 100% is a good sign that you may have more than enough architecture to get to your goal. Uh, these are percentages of a total budget. Another way of looking at that table is to look at it graphically. Any uh, spreadsheet can convert such things into nice little graphs and the tool is doing it here. Uh, we're looking at the, uh, this is actually a real example of somebody who had been using my methods in his business for about three or four years, but he had a new job offer. It's a new job, very sexy new job offer. But his older business uh, wanted to keep him in there. And he decided to use this method to look at the architecture of his life, his job, professional life. And he found that the new job looked very, this is the, uh, in about, uh, over about 15 factors, including getting an OBE and work-life balance. He found that the new job was very sexy. Okay, so just get the new job. But we also, in putting numbers on things, ask ourselves things like the plus minus uncertainty of the range uh, of you know, wh where could these things pan out in practice. So we can look at the worst possible case or worst case. And we also look at a thing called credibility, like is the data from a credible source, a credible measurement by credible people, or is it just a wild guess? Okay, and I'm, what I'm saying is architects need, when they need to estimate how good their architecture is, but they also need to estimate how bad their estimates are, their risk. And it turned out, in the final day, that the old job was the devil he knew, had very high credibility, and the new job, well, it was wild guessing and optimism, and, and frankly, it uh, lost out when every, uh, all the risks were considered. So finally, he chose the old job, and he's there now. Okay? You can uh, use these methods to architect your life. Okay. Here's another way of looking at things, again, using these charts. Uh, this little symbol is the plus-minus uncertainty range of an estimate. Uh, these yellow things are the uh, totality of all the costs. 
these are a series of design ideas or architectural ideas that we're trying to rate and understand and prioritize. Uh, ideally, we would prioritize, meaning do first, do in early sprints of Agile, those things that give us the highest benefit to cost with respect to risk. And indeed, we can automatically sort both the table and these bar charts so that the, uh, uh, value, the high value to cost items with regard to risk come first. You're now looking at engineering uh, uh, of architecture or architecture engineering. Fourth point is we need to help the client see the many critical dimensions of a requirement. Um, so uh, this particular requirement, educational safety, we're looking at things like can, can an Afghanistan uh, girl get on a bus to school without get acid thrown in her eye? Okay, educational safety. And uh, we actually did this as a BCS project on a course, just for fun, so that's where this comes from. Anyway, so educational safety is defined as the number of educational participants in a region registered as victims of assault due to their engagement. She won a Nobel Prize for that, by the way, from our friends in Oslo. And uh, each one of these uh, uh, scale variables leads to a definition like assault is killed or physical assault, education is preschool, high school, university, etc. Et uh, what you're looking at is the possibility of modeling, which is a lot of what architecture tries to do, a very complex uh, educational safety situation with very many variables. And we can have objectives for any combination of these variables, including the most critical near-term ones that we'd like to focus on. That would be an agile, uh, uh, this is a tool for helping us be agile and do high value critical things early by selecting the combination that gives, is of the highest, rate, uh, highest value for the stakeholder. But that's what I mean about helping the client see the many critical dimensions. The client's not likely to understand the technology of coming up with a scale with all these variables, although they may hint at it vaguely. Uh, our job is to say, I can structure that so I have all these variables. Then I can look at the variables that are most interesting, and then I can solve the architectural problem for the most interesting variables first and deliver high value before she gets the acid thrown in her eyes, as opposed to five years later with a delayed IT project, which seems to be the other option. Okay. So uh, here's another view of it. Uh, this is the same requirement educational safety, but uh, given that scale, we're taking a wish and we're wishing for a certain quantified level, but uh, we're selecting educational participants, teacher and student, the assault type killed in physical assault, education, high school, and the region, uh, Afghanistan, and the year or deadline, mini deadline, 2020. So now you see a highly structured, quantified requirement specification for a soft value like educational safety. And how many of you would have dived in and said, of course I'm going to structure and quantify that before I do the architectural work? Another uh, th thing we, we should feel a professional responsibility for is quality control. Uh, uh, quality control, number one, of the requirements coming into us, which are awful and need to be thrown out on the grounds that their quality control shows they have 200 major defects per page or something like that, which is normal. Uh, th these three slides are from Intel, who for 17 years has been using all of my methods, the quantification of uh, the values I just mentioned in language, and the specification quality control, which we developed for Citigroup in about 2003 here in London. And uh, basically what they show in this graph is they start off with a defect density um, of about 10 defects per page of requirement. And that's pretty good because most people just drafting requirements come up with 100 major defects per page or 200, where a page is about 300 words. But they're very good They're using structured language. They still end up at 10, but their quality standard requirements is no more than 0 0.5, about uh, 0 0.2, sorry, about 50 times better. So what they do is they have a numeric exit criteria saying these requirements cannot exit until they're written to a 50 times higher quality standard. Why waste your time on architecture with garbage in is really the question. So they have a discipline there of doing quality control. And uh, the interesting thing is it's not a very costly exercise. They talk about using an hour or two, and this is an Intel with probably higher quality standards than most of you are accustomed to. And uh, here is uh, an example of doing it where they start off at about, OK, 
okay? I reckon I've got about 10 minutes left, given our late start of five. What do you think? Five. Okay, I'll have to wind down. I can almost do that. Uh, okay, so this is a real example from Intel where they start off with delivered requirements at, at uh, uh, 312 defects for 31 pages, i.e. 10 defects per page. And they keep on saying, no, you can't deliver this to our chip architects. You have to have a much higher quality standard. So they keep on trying to get better and better and find it down to 50 times better, literally. And then they release it. This is lean. This is upstream. This is solving the problem of requirements, not in the testing uh, for two years because it doesn't work, but at the very beginning, when the, before, the, uh, before the requirements actually enter the architectural domain. Okay? This is a really good engineering practice. Here's a paper on it, which you can have access to by John Terzakis at Intel, uh, prominently mentioning my name as the author of the methods, of course, and some of the very good results. Among the results were a two or three hundred percent increase in productivity of the Intel engineers as a result of doing this quality control on language. Okay, we can read all about it, thoroughly studied. And uh, finally, uh, point six, uh, I believe it is our obligation as architects to maximize the delivery of real critical values, these 10 or 20 things. We need to maximize them in relation to resources. Okay? And in order to maximize 10 or 20 values, you've got to use numbers for the requirements that are the values required and for how good the architecture is. So this is an impact estimation table. I'll be talking a little bit more about these things in my second talk today. Uh, but uh, this table says, here are all the different architectural ideas and uh, here are the numeric ratings of how good or uh, uh, bad they are. And uh, there are some uh, summaries at the bottom of the table. Uh, these are the overall ratings for the different architectures for all the values. This one looks terribly good. This is the second best. And then here are the uh, uh, resources. And here are computations of value to cost or value to cost with relation to risks and credibility and uncertainty. And let this be, if, if you like, your picture of uh, in, uh, architecture engineering. I believe all your architectural ideas should be filtered uh, through such a, uh, an estimation. And uh, finally, um, in Agile, early feedback and measurement of how it really works to tune your ideas. I'll be saying more about that in my uh, second talk. We'll skip that, given the timing. And uh, this just says, I realize that if you're not of this culture, uh, you might have fallen asleep, you might get very angry, you might think it's irrelevant. Uh, it is heavy stuff, but I'm uh, offering you all kinds of things, including uh, books, papers, slides, if you want to pursue this or go deeper, including uh, BCS courses we've been holding for several years through the specialist group on quality. I'm going to make an offer to the architectural group to do something similar, especially for architects. And hope you know, so we can uh, use more time on it, like a couple days rather.